Okay, great. Thanks, Tom. Um, it's yeah. 605 and I'll call the meeting to order. Um, it's the January 24th, 2024 meeting of the Scarborough Housing Alliance. Uh, so thank you everybody for coming and thank you to our guests for being here. Um, we've got a couple items on the agenda and the, uh, the first of which is the approval of the minutes from September 27th, 2023. Um, Eric, thanks for putting those together and circulating them for us. So um, move. Has everybody reviewed them? If, yeah, would somebody make a motion to it? That was Bob. Bob motioned. Yeah. Okay, is there a second? I can second. All right, thanks, Michaela. Any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor of approving the minutes from September 27th, 2023, please say aye. 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 Great. Um, anybody opposed? Um, great, I think that's everybody. Um, they are unanimously approved. Thanks, everybody. Um, and Eric, thanks again for uh, the hard work on those minutes. Um, the next item on the agenda is a discussion, uh, which is an update on the CDBG grant um, on homelessness. Um, and Karen, I think, uh, is Karen Martin going to give yeah, a Yeah, Karen and, and Lauren Dembski martin uh, have been heading up that project. So they're here with us to present a couple of the facts in the initial phase before we move to more of the policy end of things. And Lauren is doing all the hard work, so I'm just uh, I'm just running the screen here. So let me yes, get. Yes, I made a the... deal with Karen. If she did the slides, I would do the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so um, hold on, just a second. Let me get it going here. Um, awesome. Okay. You can skip to that first one, Karen, if you want to. So um, thank you all uh, for letting us present tonight. I think that it's, you know, really important in that we wouldn't have been able to do this grant and um, kind of secure it and be able to allocate what we're looking to kind of achieve through this without the support, you know, of town council, of the town, public safety. So thank you. Um, and we, again, we just kind of wanted to give an update as to where we're at right now. Um, so the uh, community block grant that we got through Cumberland County runs from July 2023 through June of 2024. Um, and initially this was kind of, um, I guess, highlighted for me and Karen because in the physical year of 2022, we were seeing a huge increase of unhoused population in Scarborough, um, which really kind of brought to our attention, what can we be doing to A, kind of secure some services for those unhoused people, as well as proactively try to figure out how we can kind of decrease that number um, in, in a, again, a proactive way. Um, so that's what kind of prompted us to apply for this. Um, and in 2022, we were still seeing kind of the trickle down of ERA. Um, so Comfort Inn was still kind of functioning as almost a shelter in some ways. And then those people were being discharged um, or evicted. And so then they were kind of unhoused here in Scarborough and we were dealing with that. Um, so we were uh, awarded $15,000 through this grant. Um, and we, um, so what we were looking at doing was kind of two things, which I'll go into in just a moment. Um, but initially what we were looking to do was some kind of grassroots work. Um, and that was really to start to do some assessing around what the unhoused population looks like, um, really kind of talk to the individuals that are unhoused here in Scarborough, uh, have conversations and uh, kind of develop some data around, you know, what resources were they already accessing? What did they feel like would be helpful to them? Were they willing to be sheltered? Um, and just kind of asking some of those questions. And then once we received that data, our next step was going to be to do um, some kind of uh, compilation of that data and some consulting around next steps for the town. So in July of 2023, um, the town of Scarborough contracted with Milestone's home team. Um, and I'm not sure if anyone's aware of what uh, the home team is, but right now they uh, provide services mostly in the Portland area to the unhoused population. Um, so it's a big black van if you've seen it driving around Scarborough at all, um, but they really do um, outreach to those that are unhoused. They help to hook them up with resources. They can actually transport them, um, which is uh, huge and um, kind of a, a major success here. So they're able to transport them to the shelter. 
Um, if they are going to be leaving an encampment, they're able to kind of help pick up some of the trash. We were able to work with um, the um, you know local kind of dumpster around being able to put some trash in there to clean up some of the encampments and home team has been able to support that. They have a nurse on staff one day a week, so they're able to actually bring that nurse into encampments if there's some kind of minor medical care that's needed to be done. So we thought they would be a good team to contract with. Um, and so they were the ones that we decided to help with the assessments starting again in July of 2023. And our goal was from July, August and September into October a little bit uh, to really kind of collect that data. Um, so during that time period, we were able to talk to 13 individuals, which I'll show in just a moment kind of what that data was. Um, any questions thus far? I talk really fast, so just slow me down if you need me to. Okay. For some reason, there we go. So kind of I put together this map of, um, you know, highlights in Scarborough around where we're seeing the unhoused population. Um, and as it indicates, it's mostly the Payne Road corridor. Um, so where kind of all those yellow stars are, that is where uh, we're remaining to see some unhoused individuals. Um, the red stars are the two motels that we tend to access through general assistance. So it tends to be um, unhoused individuals that are maybe accessing general assistance, um, staying a couple nights at a motel and then probably becoming unhoused again. Uh, so these are folks that are kind of chronically unhoused. Um, so um, right now, or well, in August, I guess we'll move back to August. In August, there was about eight to 10 individuals off the Payne Road corridor um, and about three individuals um, off the Gorham Road, one to two individuals in the Pine Point Dustin area, and two to three individuals, again, that would rotate kind of through general assistance and being unhoused. Um, currently, though, is what this map represents, which is about six to, I'd say, seven individuals off the Payne Road corridor. Um, and then those two to three individuals that rotate through um, motels and general assistance. And so what we're able to kind of, from the data that we were able to collect so far and from just conversations with these individuals, we're able to kind of see that about three to four of them actually decided to be sheltered at the new homeless shelter in Westbrook. Um, so that was a huge success because they're able to offer numerous services, including intensive case management and other support services to really get folks back up on their feet. Um, one of the individuals uh, that was in the Dunstan area, we were able to secure a long-term winter rental. Uh, this individual has like an intensive, what they call an ACT team. Um, so they're able to check in with this individual and was able to secure a long-term rental. Um, we were able to, um, then also there was two to three individuals who were in one of the encampments that relocated to another town. I believe they're still unhoused, but they moved to a different town to be closer to some service providers. Any questions on that slide? Hey, Lauren, on, on that pain yeah. road, on that pain road corridor, is there a hotel that was used to to um, house people experiencing homelessness um, right kind of on the way to Target? So there a while ago, the Fairfield had been um, kind of a COVID uh, homeless shelter. Is that uh -huh. the one you're talking about that yeah. got redone? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So they had done. Um, so during COVID, they were kind of they were a shelter um, and that has totally changed management from what I know and been completely redone. Um, so it's no longer obviously acting as a shelter. But yes, the Fairfield had at one point. It is, I mean, it, that area of Pain Road is a pretty heavily trafficked area. Is there anything that like makes that a good place to like hang out as a. As an, as an unhoused, unhoused individual? individual? Yeah, it doesn't look that, I don't know, it um, looks like a busy area. Uh, and I'm yeah. wondering why, why there's that cluster. And... Sure. So what I've heard, and just kind of through conversations with the individuals that are accessing that area, is a couple of things. So one is because it is a busy area, they're able to access the dumpsters at night. So they can do, right, KFC, they can do, what is it, like Texas Roadhouse, like all those places. That's actually like how they're getting some of their, you know, foods and basic needs. Uh, we certainly know, and kind of from the public safety PD perspective, we're getting a lot of theft complaints from Martin's Walmart. And so they're able to kind of, again, access some of those basic needs from those big box stores. 
And it's also easy access over to South Portland. So the bus, the metro, which is what um, a lot of folks end up using to commute into like the greater Portland area, runs from the main mall. So it's easy access right there um, versus like the um, OOB Biddeford Saco <laughs> Green Line runs more up in Oak Hill, but doesn't go into greater Portland. Interesting. Yeah, there's also a bus stop uh, on Gallery Boulevard in front of Walmart that takes yes. you to the South Portland system. Yes, thank you. Oh, interesting, thank you. Yeah, so those are kind of, that's the key highlights that I've heard so far around yeah. Payne Road Corridor. Uh, so um, what we've learned kind of so far is when we compare back to 2022, um, we obviously um, do not have the Comfort Inn functioning as a shelter anymore. Um, and we also know there's a substantial decrease in individuals kind of utilizing the parking lots and employing cars as shelter. Um, there are certainly still, I think there's like two to three individuals I know right now that are living, you know, out of their car as shelter. But when we compare that to 2022, when I would ride through the parking lots, I would come in contact with maybe 15 to 20 individuals, like between the Walmart and the Lowe's parking lots. Um, so that has significantly decreased. And I'm not, there's, I, I don't know the rationale behind that, but that's just something that we have definitely seen a decrease in. Um, from the assessments that we gathered of the individuals, uh, we know that 12 of the 13 of those individuals were willing to be sheltered. Um, but what I think is important to highlight here is that the perception of housing uh, varies. Um, so even though some individuals say they're willing to be sheltered, to them that's their own motel room or apartment space. Um, when you offer the shelter in Westbrook, uh, they will get very hesitant and kind of um, some of them have their own trauma history with closed quarters. They're worried about bed bugs. Some of them have service dogs or animals. Um, they are not allowed to kind of sleep in the same bed or area as their partner. Um, or they've been turned away from the shelter in the past and are kind of hesitant to access again um, in terms of worried about being turned away. So it was interesting to me when I was reading through the um, the assessment to see the 12 of 13. So I went back and kind of talked to these individuals about what shelter meant to them and kind of was able to learn these things. <laughs> Do the next slide, Karen. Perfect, thank you. So this just kind of shows when we talk about um, the unhoused out of those 13 assessments here uh, in Scarborough, um, the majority of them were living in some sort of encampment. Um, again, when we compare this to 2022, uh, there was two or three encampments that I knew of that had probably up to 10 folks at a time staying in them. When we talk about encampments now, uh, the max that I see uh, kind of grouped together is like two to three. So that's a change we've seen too. But again, the majority of folks are living um, in the woods or outside in some sort of quote unquote encampment. Um, and then there's a few that again are in motels kind of rotating through or in their vehicle. So this is just a graph of um, kind of the unmet needs or the critical needs that they were able to identify. Um, and obviously the greatest need and pretty much one that everyone checked off was housing vouchers. Uh, so a lot of the work that we've been doing is helping these folks fill out Section 8, wrap vouchers, any of those housing uh, pieces that might be able to get them lower subsidized housing. We all know that those wait lists are months or years, um, so it's certainly not a short-term solution to this at all, but it does get them on the list, um, and it does eventually, you know, turn around. We've had a couple of folks over the last um, several months who have gotten, you know, calls around their vouchers, and then it's just trying to find an apartment or a shelter that fits within um, what the vouchers will pay. Um, second on that list was showers, um, and this just kept kind of coming up in my conversations with individuals, um, is access to showers, and that's one thing I'm hoping that we can kind of continue to talk about, um, I guess, as a town or as um, a team around kind of how to potentially, I guess, proactively offer something like that if possible. Um, the kind of alternative to all that is there's something called the Learning Collaborative in Portland, um, and they are able to shower there. So um, what I've been trying to do is just beg for bus tickets <laughs> um, and donate a bus tickets and then um, hand out those bus tickets so they can get over to the Learning Collaborative and take a shower 
and get clean. Um, but I think it's just something to highlight is, you know, a lot of these folks, even though they're unhoused, they really like they'll ask me for, you know, baby wipes or anything to kind of keep their hygiene up. Um, and um, then you can kind of just look at this chart, but a lot of the other things are kind of just the basic needs. Um, you know, food, we're delivering, um, you know, food boxes to individuals quite often. Um, IDs are always super important for folks, social security card, those documents that, especially if they do get called up in terms of one of the vouchers that they're gonna have to provide in order to secure an apartment, they're often missing those. So we're trying to secure those before they secure the voucher so that we're all set. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the critical needs that were identified. Hey, yeah. Lauren, it's uh, yeah. it's Bob. Now I just have a quick question: What those categories down at the bottom? What is SU treatment? And way over on the right, what is DEEP? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good question. All those acronyms, right? Um, so SU treatment would be substance use. Um, so obviously we know a lot of the unhoused population have some sort of mental health or substance use. Um, so trying to get into substance use treatment. And then DEEP is if they have ever been pulled over for like an OUI um, or an alcohol-related uh, vehicle charge, um, there's a DEEP course, which is something they need to go through in order to get their license back. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, so one of the other pieces of information that I think is just super important right now is to know that the Westbrook shelter is actually closed to any individuals that are not living in Portland encampment. Um, and I think this kind of came to be, well, it came to be at the end of December when we were looking to actually place a couple people at the shelter, we learned that they were not willing to accept them um, and they were only willing to set individuals again that live in Portland um, due to the sweeps that they are doing right now in Portland and there's also a diversion program um, where if somebody's able to commit to going to the shelter they're able to divert some charges if it's a Portland individual so unfortunately right now we're not able to access that shelter which is making some challenges for us in terms of coming up and brainstorming other ideas um, because prior to the end of December, we were able to access the shelter. Uh, we're, and we're also hoping, um, again, maybe as colder weather subsides, um, they'll reopen that to other towns. But right now, it's not an option for anyone outside of Portland encampment. So that is the kind of brief presentation, um, you know, that we have. The next steps that I think we're looking to achieve here um, is, and Karen, you can chime in here anytime you want, but um, we have what's called the, our Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program, and we have a pretty good steering committee of a variety of stakeholders, you know, kind of across the board, mental health providers, our district attorney's office, law enforcement, um, and we're really hoping to use that group to kind of brainstorm next steps now that we've collected, you know, some data. Um, I'm excited because I see a lot of progress um, and a downward kind of trend here, not an upward trend in any, you know, shape or form. So I think that that is promising news. Um, and one of the things I guess I just want to point out or kind of say to this council is I think a big part of that is the way that we have structured kind of our general assistance um, within the public safety building. I think that that has actually been uh, a huge success because I'm able to really work closely with general assistants and also um, our lead case manager in terms of really kind of getting somebody in and then fast tracked through the referral process, the eligibility, um, and really kind of just connecting them to any continuity of care or resources that they need. And we're able to do it in a pretty flawless way, which I think has been really helpful in terms of finding folks shelter. Um, so we're, we're unique in that fashion because I think we're the only town that functions with a general assistance embedded in a public safety building, um, but it really seems to be working. So I think one of the interesting things is having this diverse group of folks who can review the information that, um, uh, Lauren and the consultants have put together. Uh, and I think it's also helpful that this group, which has a really diverse set of providers, uh, can help us think through like, well, why do we think it decreased? And Lauren has pointed out some, some of the reasons. And I think we asked them directly, well, do you think it's going to, what Portland is doing in terms of, um, uh, 
removing some of the encampments, do we think that's going to be really spilling over to Scarborough? And thus far, that doesn't seem to be happening for one reason or mm -hmm. another. And I'm I'm hoping, Lauren, um, it's the case that with the new shelter that opened and with the diversity of services and, you know, the newness of that facility and really, I think some rich independent services like they have, they have the ability to do laundry. They have a lot of things that perhaps they did not have before. So I'm hoping, and I know the city of Portland is hoping that a lot of these folks really did go into the shelters, but I don't know what, I don't think we have numbers on that. The only thing I know around the shelter right now is like the shelter is full. So that is yeah. a good sign. You know, we know that at least folks in Portland are accessing the shelter as of like last night. Like usually each night right now, there's like two female beds available, which is huge compared to two months ago when there would be 50 female beds and 50 mm -hmm. male beds. Lauren, Lauren, can I ask your PowerPoint shows a Westbrook shelter? What, where's the shelter in Westbrook? So everyone asks this. So the homeless services shelter, which is run through the city of Portland, is in Westbrook. It's right over the line. So, um, that, so, so it's, that's the Riverside Street shelter. Exactly. Yep. So that's the new Portland shelter. It's just called the Ho Homeless Services Center. <clears throat> okay. But everyone gets really confused on that. <laughs> yeah. But I it is... Oh, there ahead, was Tom. also a, uh, a shelter for new Mainers that opened yes. on, on Riverside, which must have some impact here. Presumably that's freeing up beds that are, have been occupied. Um, so that must have something to play here, seems to me. Absolutely. So when that shelter opened, then they were able to move out, right, like over 100 people from the Riverside Homeless Services Shelter. Right. So all those beds opened up, right? And now we're even seeing all those beds full. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, it absolutely made an impact because it opened up almost 100 beds. Right. And the, the sweeps in Portland, I know the, the, um, the, the, the trigger for that is when there are open, open beds at the shelter, then they... Mm -hmm. And, and that was the case a month ago or so, but it sounds like now all those beds are full. Correct. Yeah. It, Lauren, I, I wonder um, if if you can talk about two things, you know, one, it strikes me that the, the homeless that, that we talk about in these surveys are, you know, what I might call uh, outdoor homeless. Right. And I wonder if there's another group that might be harder to track of people who are sleeping on other people's couches or, uh -huh. uh, Sort of bunking right. up with people who who don't have their own home, but yes. they but they're not in a tent, um, and and then the second piece is, to what extent are kids wrapped up in this homelessness, and and how do we count them? Yeah, good question. So what I can say is we're absolutely missing that population in terms of this data collection. So we're trying to actually do and not necessarily part of this grant but just in terms of kind of general assistance is where we are trying to collect some data around those folks that are staying with family members or friends um and kind of get a better grasp but that is not captured in this data um because we weren't those people tend to kind of trickle in trickle out and it's hard to necessarily um to kind of stay in contact with them so we definitely are trying to track some of that and get some better numbers around those that are quote unquote unhoused but really have some sort of shelter over their head it's just not secure and long term mm -hmm. um so it's a great question around that but that's not captured necessarily in these assessments and then in terms of kiddos we're not seeing any kids like in the outside encampments. Um, I'll say like over the last three years that, you know, I've kind of been going into encampments, I would say there's been like maybe two kids that I've ever encountered, um, but there is not currently, nor has there been kind of for the last at least year and a half, any kids in any of the encampments. Um, and if there is, I mean, obviously that's a huge risk factor and kind of goes to Child Protective Services and we get involved and um, figure out how to um, make a change there. Um, when you look at those, like the couch surfing and things like that, there are certainly high school students. So I'm working with some of the guidance counselors and social workers at the high school um, when they're able to identify like a high school student who has either been, you know, kicked 
quote unquote, kind of kicked out of their home, have chosen to left their home, staying with friends. And those folks really are, quote unquote, again, like unhoused. Um, but how do we kind of capture that? So I think when we look at unhoused, it's really, if we're looking at kids at all, it's going to be like the high school population um, around, you know, not being kind of at their parents' home. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Incidentally, yeah. I think I think I figured out the video. So if someone would be so bold as to try their video now. Oh dear. Hey, look at that. That. Now turn it off now, Brian. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> enough is enough. <laughs> I should also mention uh, one of the challenges, uh, you know, you saw that concentration of the encampments along uh, Payne Road. A number of those encampments uh, have been on land trust property and on town property. And uh, Lauren's made contact with them, uh, you know, and, and uh, we've moved them along uh, to the extent we can. There's a number of others on private property. And Lauren, maybe you could describe some of the challenges we find dealing with a, a private property owner. Sure. Um, so one of the biggest challenges we've recently had <laughs> um, is just trying to track down the property owner. So obviously, like we can we can look on like the GIS system and figure out who it belongs to. But like recently, I think most people know about the shipping container on Payne Road. Um, and we recently had two individuals move into that shipping container create a nice little wood stove. Uh, we got call after call of wood smoke kind of coming out of the top of that. So I attempted to contact that property owner. Um, there was no response, no response, sent the PD in terms of the town that this property owner lived in um, to try to track him down. Um, no response there. Finally, <laughs> um, as of two nights ago, the property owner did come into the PD um, and has agreed to criminally trespass these two people. So we are making some progress. Um, but really, when it's on private property, it's up to that property owner to come to the PD, write a witness statement, and then we'll go in and we'll trespass them. Um, but if you have a property owner who doesn't care, um, who doesn't live in the town of Scarborough, so is not kind of coming to that land, um, has not posted that land at all, it's really tricky. Um, and it's kind of comes down to, you know, do we go and track them down? And how much work and effort do we put into that? Um, this circumstance, I think, we put quite a bit of effort into because it needed to be done for safety and code reasons. I have to admit, I did not call when I saw that container being used because part of me was like, well, God bless them. <laughs> but the other part of me was like, oh, geez, I'm safety and, and whatever. So I'm glad to hear someone did um, contact because I don't think of it unless I'm driving by and then it goes in one side of my head and out the other, but yeah. And I'm sure there are other, other things going on too, similar to that. I know of some residents on Maple street that I'm a little concerned about, but I'm going to mm. talk to Brian about it. Okay. Yeah, so Brian actually went down with me to that shipping container because um, I was like, okay, let's get like a code enforcement perspective here. Well, right, right, because I know it's <laughs> against code, um, but part of me was like, oh, God, so what do I toss these people out under the nothing? I mean, anyway. That's my bleeding heart. Sorry. <laughs> you have to. It's walking right that fine line of, you know, oh. obviously this isn't safe and this isn't um, how we want these, you know, folks to be living. Right. And yet, like with these two individuals with the shipping container, they're just not willing to agree to other resources or support services. So how, you know, my work with them is really like, how do I proactively keep them warm, right? Like now right. that they're out of the shipping container and they're going to be back in the woods. And how do we do that yeah. um, without putting propane heaters in tents that could potentially blow up or what else, you know, is kind of the challenges. So that's always a fun puzzle to piece together. And, and all I can think of is I know <laughs> where I've read of the use of shipping containers for housing obviously fit it out correctly and meeting code um but yeah uh, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's, but it's that individual is, is is interesting in that they they simply choose to live that's the lifestyle now there may undoubtedly there are probably underlying conditions but oh, yeah. uh, i know uh, lauren has been in touch with them for three years consistently i think and oh, yeah. just moved from place to place and that's a uh, that's the choice they've made, and pa yeah. and and they've countless times passed up 
um, actual housing vouchers, right? In, in yeah. Our communities. yeah, that's what's really difficult. Mm. Yeah, I may have him agreed right now to access a short-term motel uh, for two to three weeks just to keep him warm. So fingers crossed. That's my goal tomorrow. <laughs> God bless you for doing this one. <laughs> Holy moly. But, but don't some of these people not want to go into shelters because of the conditions or the requirements yes. of, of being in the shelter or their substance abuse or, or whatever? Oh, absolutely. Yes. I mean, that's, you know, I guess I didn't have up on that list before, but you point out a really good, um, you know, thing around substance use is, yes, obviously you cannot use at the shelter. Um, you know, you can smoke a cigarette or a butt outside, but, you know, anyone else who's using um, opiates or anything like that, you cannot do that at the shelter. And so you're right, that impedes somebody's, you know, want or desire to access that for shelter. Mm. So some of this is choice and addiction and all those intertwining challenges. Yeah. So, so the, remind remind us, what are the next steps? We've got four or five more months uh, on this grant period. Yes. So the next phase is really talking uh, about policy. You know, what, what have we learned from the assessments and then how do we translate that into to actions? And what actions, what what are the range of actions that, that would be appropriate for Scarborough? And I think, I don't think this study is going to do it, but I think in terms of, of sort of a bigger housing question, and I think the bigger housing question is, you know, I think we've been providing a lot of housing in, in Scarborough, um, certainly compared to other folks. So what does that mean? How do you, does that trickle down? What does that mean in terms of the, the total demand, both in Scarborough and in the region? And that those are some big questions that um, we probably need to come back to this committee to discuss. So if anybody's got thoughts yeah. about um, policy and you know, send a note to Lauren or to me, mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that really is our next step. I will tell you that I was I was flabbergasted when that uh, proposal that's been floating around there to allow hotels to convert to workforce housing with some affordable housing in it. My fellow counselors were poo pooing it. Of course, they, they it's been floating around. I have to say they aren't up on exactly what was what, but. Um, I, and I've got to do some more lobbying, obviously, but um, I I was just, I was floored to be from, from a couple of people that I thought would be more supportive of at least the concept of it. But it's like there's a fear in the council. I don't know if fear is the right word. Um, don't quote me on that, Drew, if you're listening. Uh, Not yeah. a <laughs> But, yes, agree. That, that might be a good segue <laughs> to our next agenda item. Yeah, but anyway, of of um, this balance between growth and the concerns about growth that's, that have been, you know, uh, named in in our survey, community survey, and but <laughs> also you know, what do we want to be as a community and the balance of people living in the community? And, and as you guys know, I'm, I'm just, I, I just know, cause I know so many of the stories of the working people who aren't making a lot of money. They're making minimum wage and they are doing critical work for, for our communities, i.e., you know, the stores, you know, restaurants, um, um, just, and you know whatever uh contractors uh who can't afford to live anywhere near here um and it and it really i don't know it, it's it's just been frustrating for me so any further help i can get from you guys on this as far as re-educating the council on what it means um and and yeah jimmy let me just bring the committee up to speed yeah. The committee took this Sorry. matter up about a year ago, and it worked its way through Ordinance Committee, I think sometime in April or May last year. They reported it out, and then the town really got uh, fully involved in the school, school yeah. matter, and also there's a growth management. Uh, right. at, at any rate, this was a convenient thing to push. 
So it's finally resurfaced. It landed back on the, or for the first time on the council agenda last week. Right. And I was not at that meeting and Jim Marie can certainly give you a firsthand account, but uh, there was a lengthy, somewhat contentious discussion. In the end, it was passed 5-2 yep. in first reading. And so it will go to the planning board for review and comment. Um, but as Jim Marie indicated, I, I think there's a couple things going on. One, the delay, I think people have forgotten. Yep. And I should also admit, I, I'm not sure that it's all that important anymore. At the time we were first talking about this, we actually had a hotel operator express interest in this. Right. That sense uh, kind of taking care of itself. So I don't know how much interest there is in this to begin with and whether the whether it's worth and, the effort. And I, Well, I think it's worth the effort. Okay. That's because I'm trying to be proactive with zoning in town because for some reason, my fellow counselors are falling back on contract zoning. And to me, contract zoning is nothing more than quid pro quo uh, spot zoning. <laughs> and that causes its own issues. Because, you know, I, I own a property and I have certain expectations about what the zoning is, where I am. And all of a sudden, boom, the council saying, well, we're going to just change the zoning next to you. Just yeah, for the, the, you There know? seems to be a lot of benefit to doing this proactively and doing it before yeah. there's a request so that people can um, actually respond to the set of tools that we have available in our town. Thank I you. Think, I think one of the things that uh, I, I believe was a sticking point was as proposed by this committee and in the first reading draft, there was an exemption from the growth management ordinance for all the units yeah. involved. I think one fairly simple accommodation would be to have them um, draw from the pool. There's an affordable housing pool that's provided for. And so it's not fully exempt um, and they would be eligible to draw from that pool. It's competitive, but so far there hasn't been a real competition for those, right. those units. Yeah. And, and the other thing is, <clears throat> remind my, the counselors that no one's saying they're doing this tomorrow. Yeah. No. But it's uh, just, uh, you say it's a tool in the toolbox, Brian. Yeah, I, I do think that one of the distinctions with this, with that policy, the way it was drafted, was that um, there was an exemption only to the extent that the number of rooms was being duplicated. So any new creation was not exempted. Yeah, so, I don't, I'd have so to. If you had a 10, if you had a 10 unit, you know, 10 unit hotel, you could get 10 units of housing exempted and then any expansion wouldn't be. Yeah. And maybe there's some cleanup around that. Yeah, right. And I think they're willing to do it, but they, yeah. and I will let you know that they aren't looking for a fast track on it, nor am I, mm. because it will definitely go down in flames if it's fast tracked. I just yeah. need some more education, uh, knowledge building, <laughs> reminding folks of why and why it's important. And I do have the chamber, I have a, I forgot that uh, the chamber had been involved and I was pleasantly surprised when Eamon Dundon, who's their political advocate, did speak uh, in favor. And he is he is going to get some businesses involved, I believe, you know, saying, oh, my God, this would be so helpful to us yeah. from an economic development point of view. So anyway. So Brian, I think there's an opportunity for this community to perhaps to be involved and in, in way back in on the matter uh, when it circles back to council. Um, I'll be sure to share with you the planning board's uh, comments on the on the topic. Great. Oh, that's terrific. Yeah, you know, I do remember um, over the past year ish, um, in other jurisdictions that I've done work in, seeing um, hotel motel conversions for sale uh, elsewhere in the country. Yep. Um, you know, this is this is a thing that's done to create affordable housing and and workforce housing. Um, and with interest rates rising and construction costs going up, um, you know, the more tools, the better. Yep. Yeah. The other thing I just note a year ago, I think we we're all theorizing that hospitality might be changing, you know, and, and they might, you know, hotel operators might be looking for an alternative. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, I'm not sure what's uh, i can't speak to it uh we have two hotels being proposed in town so there's there's new construction in hotels yeah. so i'm not sure if that theory works well right and i and <clears throat> i can tell you that it's my understanding and this is very unofficial but from my contacts whatever that vrbo and 
uh, you know, Airbnb is not as popular as it was. Mm. Um, so anyway, it's like anything, things shift, but I just want it to be available in case we ever needed something like that or the opportunity presented itself. That's all I'm saying. I just thought it was a cool idea. Yeah. To let it go. <laughs> Tom, was there was there anything more to the hotel motel discussion than than that? Do you think there really wasn't? I just wanted you to know that it's resurfaced and it's something uh, this committee was passionate about, and I think yeah. you might want to get reengaged. Great. Um, Tom, it's it's not on the agenda, but um, we've got a, a potential new uh, member of the committee. Do you want to wait till next meeting for that, or? I, no, I think uh, Bill Shanahan's name has been posted, so to speak. And okay. so the council is in a position to appoint uh, Bill Shanahan as a full voting member at your at their next meeting on the 7th. So I think he'll join us at your, your next meeting. Um, Brian, do you want to give just a quick little backdrop on, on Bill, or do you want to save that for his appearance? Well, I, I think we can save most of it um, for his appearance, but I'll, I'll say that he's a, a regionally and nationally recognized expert in housing. Um, he's a Scarborough resident and and we will, um, you know, if and when he's appointed, uh, we will benefit from his, his presence on the committee. And I need to oh. confirm this, and I think he's taking the place of Dick LaRue. Dick yes. chose not to be reappointed. No. <laughs> and it's not an if, it's a when. Okay. I'm on that committee. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I'm trying to respect the role of the council, Jean Marie. Yes, I know. I know. <laughs> Great. Um well uh Drew Drew, Lauren, and Karen are, are the three members of the public who are here. Um do you have any comments for us? No. I don't think so. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, and thanks for the work that you've done. Uh, anybody okay. else on the Alliance uh, have anything for everybody? Uh, Bill? You know, this is very informative for me. Uh, and Lauren, uh, <clears throat> you're talking to the choir when you're talking to this group uh, because we know each other and we know our commitments to... Uh, caring for people who are in difficult situations. Uh, so uh, we're, whether it's uh, ideas that maybe haven't been tested, ideas that you've had, uh, things that we can do, put them forward. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, we're very sympathetic to the idea that there are people who are in difficult circumstances uh, and need assistance. We're not quite sure always what that might be, but uh, uh, people like you are a professional in this space uh, can guide us and we're happy to listen. So I appreciate your presentation today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. That means a lot. And I think that's one of the things that excites me the most about the work we're doing in the community is I feel like Scarborough is open to kind of some innovative new ideas um, and that it always that it just feels really supportive, um, especially when we are doing some data collection around this type of uh, vulnerable po population. So thank you. Brian, if I could just share a piece of, I guess, personal and professional news with me. I was just appointed to the board of directors for the Habitat uh, affiliate for Greater Portland. Oh, so right. really Amazing. pleased to be part of that group. Nice. Um, great. You nice. know, this committee had a great partnership uh, <laughs> with the town in Carpenter Court. They are very anxious to do something similar in the future. So uh, I'm very pleased to be kind of on the inside with them and help share some of my experience on the municipal side to see if whether we can do it in Scarborough or, or in another community. I'm um, hopeful I can open some doors for them or at least uh, get get an audience with some of my colleagues. So really pleased to, to be able to put some time and effort there. No, that's terrific. Um, congratulations, Tom. And, and that's a great group. Yeah, thank you. Would anybody like to tackle the last item on the agenda for us? 
please. <laughs> Bill, you're usually good at that. What's the last item on the agenda? <laughs> it's titled adjournment tonight, Bill. Oh. <laughs> so move, so move. All right. Thank you, Bill Donovan. Good We're to see at 6.50. Good to see all of you. Good to yeah. see everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you for your patience. We'll be, back, we'll be back in person uh, next next meeting. We'll have a hybrid option, of course, too. Okay? Uh, sorry sorry about the bad light, but the Lanai doesn't have good lighting. Oh, yeah. stop the it. Struggle is real, Bob. <laughs> Tom, I hope you're feeling better. You look, you look a little better. Recovery. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, though. Thank you all. Yep. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Bye, Bob. Have a good nice evening. to see you. Haven't seen you in ages. Bye. Bye. Karen, Karen we still Karen. need that coffee. We do. That sounds yeah. great. I'll I'll be in touch. Okay. Great. Luna Cafe. There you go. Bye bye.